we have so wandered so far from our evolutionary roots. Um, the diet we eat is so radically different. Um, we, uh, ha- are, we eat continuously. We eat a lot of sugar. We eat a lot of fructose. We eat a lot of um, high, high uh, glycemic index foods. Uh, so we are continuously uh, forcing the release of insulin. Um, uh, we have disrupted our microbiome. We are eating uh, uh, so many synthetic compounds uh, uh, in our diet, putting them on our skin. Uh, So all of those factors will drive uh, insulin resistance. All of those factors increase our vulnerability to autoimmunity. Hello, everyone. Welcome to a whole new level. This is Dr. Casey Means, co-founder and chief medical officer of Levels. I am so excited for today's conversation. Dr. Terry Walls needs no introduction, but I am so excited to do one because I have been a huge follower of her work for over 10 years, and it has had a profound impact on my life professionally and personally as one of the first entry points and first exposure into functional medicine for me. So I am incredibly grateful. Uh, Dr. Walls is a clinical professor of medicine at University of Iowa and also maintains a prolific research career. She's had over 60 peer-reviewed scientific abstracts, posters, and papers And her personal story is incredible. She has experience as a patient being diagnosed with multiple sclerosis over 20 years ago, an autoimmune disease that left her in a wheelchair and on a path towards being bedridden. And she took her health into her own hands. She scoured the literature to understand if there were any possible treatments for MS and ultimately developed the WALS protocol, which is a nutrition and lifestyle program to treat all chronic autoimmune diseases which reversed her disease process, restored her health, and allowed her to get out of her wheelchair and back on her feet. Her learnings turned into an incredible book called The Walls Protocol, and she gave a TEDx talk that has over 3.5 million views on YouTube called Minding Your Mitochondria, which everyone should go out and watch um, after listening to this podcast. She's inspired countless individuals to make the choices to support their health and vitality, and I am so excited to welcome you, Dr. Walls, to the podcast and to dig in specifically to the relationship between blood sugar, metabolic health, and autoimmune disease. Welcome to a whole new level. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Means. So for those who may not be familiar, just to kind of start off the conversation, can you define for people what an autoimmune disease is, a a framework for thinking about this process in the body, and, and how autoimmune diseases may be similar from a root cause perspective, even though uh, they may look uh, very different from each other symptom, uh, from a symptom perspective. Okay. So when I was in medical school a few years ago, uh, we, we're, we're taught that autoimmune diseases are the immune cells attacking self. We don't really know why. Uh, they, for reasons entirely unknown, uh, must be genetic. Uh, at that point, we didn't even link infections. And all we had uh, was prednisone. Uh, and then we started adding some other uh, immune suppressing drugs. And our understanding's gotten a little bit more sophisticated. Uh, but we appreciate that there are um, hundreds of genes that increase the risk. And there's still this long list of unknown environmental factors. And the conventional approach still focuses uh, entirely on immune suppression. Uh, and of course, that's not the approach uh, that I take, uh, nor is it the approach that I teach. I focus on what are all the modifiable lifestyle factors that we can address. Uh, so we focus on creating health. And as a byproduct, you may discover that your chronic diseases begin to get under better control and then begin to regress. And then we have to begin to reduce and often eliminate uh, prescription medication after prescription medication. In your book, The Walls Protocol, you talk about seven specific ways that all autoimmune diseases are similar and characteristics that are really universal amongst different autoimmune diseases. Can you talk about uh, these principles and, and 
both describe what they are, but also how you came to this realization? Well, um, I'm going to take you back to my health journey here for a little bit, you know. So uh, 40 years ago, during medical school, I started having these electrical face pains. Uh, and they build over a period of uh, the next seven years. Uh, uh, I had an episode of visual dimming. Uh, see a neurologist, can't explain that. Fortunately, they don't connect my uh, face pain and visual dimming because they could have diagnosed MS then. Fortunately for me, they did not. Um, I, uh, 13 years later, after I had my two kids, then I developed le leg weakness. See the best people, take the newest drugs, and still within three years, I'm in a tilt recline wheelchair. Uh, and that's when I decided, like, you know what? It's pretty clear I'm going to become bedridden, demented, and the trajectory of my face pain is such that it's more frequent, more severe, far more difficult to turn off. I'm already on maximum uh, dose of meds. I'm already going to the pain clinic. I've already gone to multiple pain centers. Uh, I am likely to have my face pain turned permanently on. And at that point, light sound uh, triggers my pain. Speaking triggers my pain. Swallowing triggers my pain. Uh, and I'm taking high-dose solumedrol when these episodes turn up. So I'm like, okay, I've got young kids. I have to do everything that I possibly can. So... I can still read. I went to PubMed and I started reading the basic science. You know, you know, at first I was looking for drug development studies. Then I had this big aha, like, I can't get these drugs. So I switched over to start reading nutraceutical studies and started with a supplement cocktail. And so I created this supplement cocktail uh, and I was focusing in on uh, cognitive decline, Alzheimer's, Hydrogen's disease, ALS. Because the nature of my disease had been a, a slow progression, it looked much more like a progressive MS, even though I'd had two relapses in my entire, you know, at that point, 27 year history of my disease. And it had appeared to me that the root problem was mitochondria, that they couldn't make enough energy. So my supplement cocktail was focused on mitochondrial uh, nutri nutraceuticals. And after six months, you know, they I, I was no better, so I was pissed off, and I stopped the model. Uh, and I couldn't get up, couldn't go to work. Uh, and after, on the third day, uh, uh, my wife, Jackie, says, Honey, why don't, you, why don't you take the supplements again? I mean, what's it going to hurt? So I, I take them, and the next day, I can get up and I can go to work. Now, mind you, I, I'm still struggling with fatigue, but I'm like, oh, my God. That was really cool. So two weeks later, I do the same thing. I stop my supplements, wait three days, start them up to the third day, and I can pop back up and, and go to work. Now, mind you, by popping up is hardly popping that much, but you know, I, I could at least go to work. And, and I was like, this was empowering. Like, oh my God, there is something to this. So now I am really excited about reading the literature. So every day I, I'm scanning and reading a paper or two after my uh, family's uh, gone to bed. And I'm still okay with thinking that I can get by with four to five hours of sleep a night. So I can spend my time reading, not realizing that that was a, probably not a very smart thing to be doing. Uh, and, you know, for years, I, I really focused on fixing my mitochondria with supplements. Uh, and so I, I get a gradually more complicated uh, supplement cocktail, you know, and I find IFM take their course on functional medicine, have a little deeper understanding uh, uh, at, at a longer list of supplements. And then a couple months later, I had this really big aha. Like, what if, you know, because I'd already uh, switched from being a vegetarian to a paleo diet based on uh, Lauren Cordain's work and his papers. Um, but I had, I had this idea like what if I took this long list of supplements and said where are they in the food supply and I got them from the food so it was the first decision that I said I'm going to focus on creating health I uh, and so that was more research um, that I had to do and the Linus uh, Pauling Institute on micronutrients was very helpful they helped me identify the food sources and so in the early days I had these long list of foods that I was 
uh, stressing on my diet. And this new focus started on uh, December 26th. And within a month, I, I was not as exhausted. I, and my physical therapist said, no, Terry, you're getting stronger. And he began to advance my exercises. Uh, and within three months, uh, I, I do this really radical thing. I get out of my wheelchair and I walk down the hall and mail a letter. And, and my uh, colleagues are like, oh my God, Dr. Walls, you're, you're walking. You're, you're walking. I, uh, and so, uh, and that's stunning. And then, you know, three months after that, um, I, well, actually maybe it's about four months after that, I decided I want to try bike riding again. And we have this emergency family meeting. It's on Mother's Day. And we decided that I can try riding my bike. Uh, you know, and my son's going to jog alongside on the left. My daughter Zeb's going to jog alongside. On the right. And Jack's going to uh, follow on her bike. And I push off, but it wobbles a little bit. But I catch my balance, and I'm biking. And my kids are crying. Jackie's crying. I'm crying. If you look at my eyes closely, see I'm crying. Reliving that moment. Because that's when I figured out. Because up, up until then, as part of the uh, adaptation to living with a progressive neurodegenerative disease, is you let go of the future. You take each day as it unfolds. And so even though I was remarkably better walking around the neighborhood, I was still taking each day as it unfolded. And all of my physicians for seven years had said, you've got secondary progressive MS, functional thoughts lost will never come back. So I didn't know what was happening. I just knew that day by day, but the day I rode my bike, I knew that the current understanding of MS was incomplete. And that who knew how much recovery might be possible. I, and in fact, uh, at, at four months after that, I do an 18.5 mile bike ride with my family. Once again, we're all crying. You know, my, my kids are crying, my wife's crying, and I'm crying uh, when I finish uh, that bike ride. I, and so that really transformed uh, how I thought about disease and health. It transformed the way I practice medicine. And it would transform uh, uh, my mission in life and the way I conduct my research. And now back, back to your question. I, I know I, I sort of got uh, sidewinded by my uh, story there. No, no, I, I'm, I'm speechless hearing it. And I mean, I've heard it, you know, in your book and in your TED Talk, but hearing it from you, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm bowled over. And I am just so grateful to you for the work that you put in to dig deeper and to challenge the convention and, um, you know, the approach, the philosophy that we were really indoctrinated with in medical school um, and and go to some of the, the preclinical research, you know, the mouse research and actually um, put together a whole new framework for thinking about health that was really based on systems biology and around giving the cells what they need to function properly. Um, yeah, it was, this was all about uh, uh, thinking uh, about the cells. Uh, when I, once I zeroed in on, okay, the mitochondria, I've got to uh, get the nutrition right for the mitochondria. Of course, I was thinking supplements, what were all the supplement cocktails, which got complicated. And then I would, uh, you know, that IFM course was helpful. Uh, but still nobody was talking about the microbiome yet, uh, cause we didn't know about that. Um, and it's sort of embarrassing now to, to realize how long it took me to think, okay, I, I, I had made some dietary changes that were important, but what if I structured instead of thinking about what to avoid, what I should be eating and I could use all these things that I said were important for mitochondria figure out where they were, the food supply, and probably other really important molecules would come along as well. Uh, and I, I mean, I want everyone to know that I, I did not get better from that supplement cockpit. Mm. You know, people have heard about my use of electrical stimulation muscles. I did not recover as much as I love e-stim 
I did not recover. The magic was when I shifted my thinking to creating health. Am mm -hmm. I doing everything that I can? Have I maximized my nutrition using food to the very best that I possibly can? Have I uh, gone back to meditation? Uh, and I had, so I re redid that. And I was, I had always stayed on the exercise bed, right? Um, so I, I continued to work very hard with my physical therapist. But it, it's the creation of health. When we focus on treating disease, we get it wrong. We, when we, even when we focus on those mouse model preclinical studies, we're still going to get those wrong because they're focused on understanding a pathology, one molecular pathway. And health and life are deeply interconnected. All of that metabolic pathways are so richly interconnected with checks and balances that when we focus on pathology, it, it, we will not be able to correct health. But when we focus on health, on what are all the things that underpin health, and add them incremental by incremental step. That's when the magic happens for me, and that's when the magic happens in the patients I take care of. I love that so much. And something that I think in a lot of ways you really got me starting to think about, which now is the dominant way I view health and medicine is that we have to focus on the cell. All health and disease comes from either cellular function or cellular dysfunction. This is the, the basic, oh, one of the building blocks of our bodies. Obviously there's the atomic level as well, but these are these beautiful machines that are working so hard, but they need specific things to function properly. And you know, they need the avoidance of other things to function properly. And that's where that really beautiful relationship between food and the cell comes into play. Because like you said, supplements may have a few of these things that the cell needs, but food has thousands of chemicals that we don't even know about what some of these are that, that, uh, that give this beautiful machine what it needs to, to, to generate health for us. And so you know, a lot of what we're really kind of in part trying to do at levels is to match what the body's needs are with what you can give it. If we can have more awareness to what the body needs inside this black box, we can then, you know, better serve it. And, um, and so that's sort of the concept we talk about a lot with biologic observability. How do we see inside the black box more? But I think a point that, that you make that is so important is that when we focus on real whole cleanly grown foods, we're fighting most of the battle here. You know, we're getting those thousands and thousands of chemicals in plants that are going to do such good work for our cells. It, and I believe that number is actually about 80,000 uh, constituents. It's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah and, that, and that's in plants. And then if we, you know, go into the uh, uh, animal proteins and, and to the fungi uh, as well, uh, then that number becomes even larger. Uh, and so, and if we think about our ancestral beginnings, whether we go back as Homo sapiens, you know, 250,000 years, or we diverge from the primates, 6 million years, or when we became mammals, 200 million years, or when we were unicellular, which are now billions of years, we have this very long history of, um, uh, metabolic complexity that uh, means that the solutions are, aren't going to be a single molecule drug-based solution. We have to be able to honor that uh, complexity of, uh, of our biochemical capital. Absolutely. So well said. And so what I'd love to, to pick your brain about here is focusing on the mitochondria. Um, okay. Your TED talk is called Mining the Mitochondria. This clearly became something that came up in the research for you showing that mitochondria and mitochondrial dysfunction may be really a centralizing factor in many of the different diseases we're seeing. And mitochondria are really um, a core part of our metabolism. And so I'd, I'd love to hear um, maybe this link between why mitochondrial dysfunction and when mitochondria aren't working properly how that can then lead to 
the body attacking itself in autoimmune disease? What's that pathway between problems with our mitochondria, which, and unfortunately, like Western modern lifestyle in many ways are hijacking the mitochondria and making, making them dysfunctional. And we can talk about some of the reasons for that. Um, but then how that translates to being a feature that links all autoimmune diseases and the body then essentially turning on itself and, and creating a mutant response against the body. You know, the way I, um, it, it, and I might be incorrect here, but I see it more as an accelerant that if your mitochondria cannot generate energy efficiently, uh, then whatever disease processes you have will be accelerated. Um, so if you have uh, obesity, you know, that's going to be accelerated. If you have insulin resistance, that will be accelerated. If you are in the prodrome phase of your autoimmune disease, which uh, typically um, we've identified five to 10 years of prodrome uh, before you begin developing autoantibodies, and then another five to 10 years, and then you have systemic autoimmune disease. So that, that's one way as an accelerant. Another way that um, uh, is their involvement in the cell danger response. Uh, and that's something I've become uh, uh, more aware of uh, recently. And when I gave my TED talk, I don't, I, I was not aware of the cell danger response and I don't think there was a lot of research on that yet. Um, but what, what happens is uh, if the cell is damaged uh, and it breaks, and so now some of the contents, the molecules that should reside inside the cell, such as ATP, uh, or the inner uh, membranes of the mitochondria, uh, are now extracellular. And so in the neighboring cells, they see these damage-associated molecular patterns. Uh, and so they interact with the ATP that's extracellular. That will turn on and change the gene expression of that neighboring cell who will say like, oh my God, terrible things are happening here. My, my kindred are dying, call in the innate immune system. And so the innate immune system is very vigorously activated. And so that will, will again accelerate your immune dysfunction and will accelerate autoimmunity. And that will continue uh, until the, ex the extracellular contents of uh, uh, intracellular compartments, so the extracellular ATP uh, is no longer uh, present in the neighborhood. So I recently, uh, for example, broke my wrist out like I And so from those uh, bony fragments, uh, the ATP would have been disrupted and the immune system uh, uh, was called in uh, dissolving and cleaning up uh, the fragments. And then as part of the healing, they will then call in the stem cells uh, to come in and begin the uh, repair of the bony callus. And then if the healing continues to go well, then they will integrate and remodel the bone and the ligaments so that my wrist is now fine. That requires a healthy mitochondria to do all, all, all of those steps. And if your mitochondria are not healthy, you can get stuck in the uh, first step, the overly aggressive innate immune system. And we see that with COVID-19. People die in the ARDS of the cytokine storm. And if they manage to get through that and they get stuck at the next step, then we see them uh, developing severe pulmonary fibrosis and liver cirrhosis. And they may need a heart and lung liver transplant. If they get stuck at the third step, then we see the persisting um, excess immune activation, the long hauler symptoms, uh, and the increased risk for uh, autoimmune uh, problems. And so you have to, you want to have healthy mitochondria. So I, I can respond appropriately to trauma you know, when you break your arm or you burn, burn your hand, burn your skin or have an infection, so I can deal with the problem quickly, appropriately, and then have complete resolution and heal. 
Very interesting. Um, there's some some research suggesting that with several autoimmune diseases, there seems to be increased prevalence or worsen disease severity in the context of elevated blood sugar or diagnosed metabolic dysfunction. So type 2 diabetes or obesity. I'd love right, to insulin get, resistance. or insulin resistance. Yes. And I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on where we are. What is the landscape of our understanding of the relationship between metabolic disease, i.e. insulin resistance, elevated blood sugar, hyperglycemia, and the onset or exacerbation of autoimmune diseases? Well, um, I'll talk about this in the context of MS, uh, and then I will conjecturize that it's probably indicative of all of the other uh, major systemic autoimmune problems. Uh, and I was, uh, you know, I go to the American committees uh, in the European uh, big uh, MS research centers. Uh, and both of these uh, scientific uh, communities were talking about the, how if you have metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance, uh, diabetes, you have a uh, much more aggressive disease, much more uh, 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 rapid decline into disability requiring a cane, walker, wheelchair, much more rapid decline into uh, cognitive impairment. Uh, and uh, then they also what we're talking about the rate of diabetes, metabolic syndrome, insulin resistance is about doubled in people with diabetes as compared to the general public. I, which then got me, it, I said, okay, I went back to my team. I said, okay, let's take a look. So I, I, I so regret that we did not measure the waist circumference of our most recent study, like we should have done that. But we did collect a number of other uh, biomarkers uh, that we then uh, did look at. Uh, and so we uh, did see that uh, there is a higher rate of markers that suggest folks are at a much higher rate of metabolic syndrome in the cohort uh, that we recently studied. Uh, and so it matched what people see or were reporting uh, in, the, in uh, other studies. And I think that we already know that elevated glucose and insulin resistance metabolic syndrome uh, uh, worsens the risk for Alzheimer's, for early cognitive decline, uh, worsens the risk for cardiovascular disease, uh, for heart attack, uh, for sudden death. So I think the mitochondrial dysfunction is really an accelerant. Uh, uh, this is a uh, not enough energy uh, that uh, puts all of these tissues uh, in strain, and it will accelerate the disease process. In addition, uh, because of the cell danger response, uh, we now know the mitochondria are deeply involved in recognizing uh, cell danger, uh, that when a cell is damaged uh, and uh, is lysed in the inner contents spill out into the extracellular space, those molecules, particularly ATP, are recognized by the cell membranes, and that activates the innate immune system. Uh, and then um, uh, that uh, will address the pathogen, the infection, or as in when I broke my wrist, uh, the fracture, and cleans up the debris. Uh, and then the second step is uh, the mitochondria involved in that second step. They'll call in the stem cells to do the repair work. And then the third step, which is reintegrating the repaired tissues back into the surrounding tissues so they can function normally and complete healing and resolve the inflammation. And the mitochondria is involved in all three of those steps. So uh, it's both an accelerant and it's intimately involved in immune function uh, and uh, either accelerating immune function uh, or failing to resolve the immune dysfunction. Uh, so it, it has uh, dual roles. It, it, I think it's a very big player in autoimmunity, but it's also a, a very big player in uh, most of our uh, non-infectious um, uh, chronic disease states, uh, whether it's a mental health problem, uh, obesity, diabetes, um, cardiovascular disease. And 
you've done quite a bit of clinical research in the MS population mm -hmm. um, and have have looked at several biomarkers in your research of metabolic health in this population. And what do you see in your own data set in terms of um, rates of increased blood sugar or insulin resistance or metabolic dysfunction um, in a population with MS versus um, a uh, non-autoimmune control population? Are you, are you seeing higher rates of these? Um, yeah, that, that, that's a very consistent finding uh, across most uh, autoimmune disease states, whether it's uh, MS, uh, lupus, uh, RA, um, uh, probably true for psoriasis, although I don't know that. Uh, I, I certainly predict that uh, of the hundreds of autoimmune diseases that they will probably have uh, one and a half to two and a half times uh, the rate of the general population of insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And, and I'm curious, what do you think is going on here in terms of the mechanisms in terms of sort of chicken and the egg? Is it that hyperglycemia induces you know, mitochondrial dysfunction through increased reactive oxygen species, and then that leads to this dysfunction that may need, lead to well, um, <clears throat> immune reactivity? Or is there something else going on where maybe something else is causing, causing mitochondrial dysfunction, and then that's leading to both metabolic disease and autoimmune disease? Or, or what's the model that we can kind of think about this relationship? We've rec we have so wandered so far from our evolutionary roots um, the diet we eat is so radically different. Um, we, uh, ha are, we eat continuously. We eat a lot of sugar. We eat a lot of fructose. We eat a lot of um, high, high uh, glycemic index foods. Uh, so we are continuously uh, forcing the release of insulin. Um, uh, we have disrupted our microbiome. We are eating uh, so, uh, so many synthetic compounds. Uh, uh, in our diet, putting them on our skin. Uh, so all of those factors will drive uh, insulin resistance. All of those factors increase our vulnerability to autoimmunity. All of those factors increase our vulnerability to serious mental health problems in chronic disease states. So I think the root cause is that we have terrible diets, we have uh, toxic exposures. We have uh, a lot of adverse childhood events and early uh, trauma for our children. We have a lot of chronic stress as adults, and we don't have enough hormetic stress uh, uh, followed by sufficient recovery time. So we build stronger um, uh, muscles, stronger bones, uh, and that we have more efficient uh, metabolic pathways. I feel like that that summary alone of all the different things that are impacting our core fundamental cellular biology from not working, if we could just like print out that list and which, you know, of course, if people read your book, they're going to see this, but, and, and just, and just focus on, there are so many different aspects of our modern living that are ultimately um, feeding into this common denominator, which is mitochondrial dysfunction and, and poor cellular health. And um, while I feel like it can be overwhelming for people to think of all those things that need to be right, you know, it can almost seem hopeless. I think it's actually really an opportunity because there's so many different areas that you can focus on, you, you know, to to do right by yourselves. It, and what what I want people to do is to uh, start small. You know, when I, when I talk about behavior change, uh, I invite them to think about, you know, some aspect of uh, their health behaviors that they could begin to improve. So we get curious, we're going to talk about diet, we're going to talk about meditation, exercise, sleep. Uh, and, you know, in some of my studies, we make you do everything all at once. And in some ways, that's easier. Uh, in my clinical practice, uh, well, it, that's going to be a, a very kind conversation. Like, okay, so here are the domains. Where do you want to start? Let's come up with a goal that you're confident you can really do. Because I want you to have a, a change that you can actually do as opposed to a change that you only do 50%. And then we build on that success. That's, that's such, such a wise approach, you know, giving people uh, the sort of manageable 
entry points to start and maybe start seeing them th- that success and then using that as a way to really fuel and catalyze continued uh, behavior change. And, um, you know, I, thing- I used to uh, insist that people, you know, do the Wallace diet first mm-hmm. as a first step. Uh, and I actually have become a little more mellow about that now, realizing that for some, they have to meditate first mm. and get their stress down, more manageable, uh, and then they can begin addressing uh, their uh, food choices. Interesting. So for each person, sort of a personalized approach to what is going to be foundational for the bigger behavior. For them. And, the and what yeah. they're willing to do, what they and their family are willing to do. Uh, because even if I think it's got to be food, if they think, no, 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 uh, we want to do uh, prayer and meditation, well, that's what they're going to do. And, yeah. And I, I should meet them where they're at. Yes. Well, shifting things into to getting into si- some of the hard science here, because a lot of our listeners really love the mechanistic um, aspects. You, you and I had a conversation recently about a really interesting um chemical mediator in the body called osteopontin. And this was, you've undercovered some really interesting work about how this chemical that is secreted in the, in the adipose tissue, um, when it's high, can have really negative and toxic effects on the brain. And so this is sort of one of these links between metabolic disease, high levels of visceral fat and visceral adiposity, um, this this cytokine I, I i'm not exactly sure how i would categorize it and then but then the the degeneration neurodegeneration and neurologic disease can you can you describe for people what this relationship yeah. is and what we've learned about it so it's also involved uh, in bone health uh so it's an important uh compound there uh, we know that it is involved in immune uh regulation uh and people who have rheumatoid arthritis uh, systemic lupus uh, MS are, have been uh, seen to have elevated levels of osteopontin. Uh, and then uh, again, I was, when I was at one of my MS research meetings, I was listening to researchers talk about uh, osteopontin's effect on the microglia. And the microglia um, are the monitors of the brain environment. Uh, and depending on if the microglia see the brain environment as hostile, they will begin attacking the invaders uh, and, and killing brain cells and killing myelin and killing synapses and leading to rapid uh, atrophy of the affected parts of the brain. Or the microglia can see like, this is a great environment. Everything looks good. But I see a few strained synapses and parts of the brain that need nurturing support. So I'm going to go there, secrete all of these nurturing compounds, and I'll repair the myelin. I'll repair the synapses. uh, And so microglia can be restorative or destructive. And what intrigued me was they were discussing how high osteopontin accelerates the microglia to be very destructive, which then got me into reading. Uh, and so this has been known uh, for some time. Uh, uh, this has been uh, reproduced that osteopontin uh, can shift the microglia to be more destructive. And what drives high osteopontin? Insulin resistance. Too much central obesity. I and so uh, I have a freezer uh, full of specimens. Uh, and so we've been writing grants. We just submitted a grant to look at our freezer, uh, and osteopontin was one of the biomarkers that we proposed to analyze. So I'll be able to tell you, hopefully, uh, and the the funding cycle will run three years. It'll be three years before I'll know this answer, but hopefully in three to four years, we can have this conversation and we'll be able to tell you what, what we saw. Very, very interesting. I mean, this is a, that's a, osteopontin, I think is a word that most people have, is not on their radar yet. And so it's really exciting to hear from you that this might be an area of, you know, of strong interest and also actionable interest because from from what it sounds like, if people can improve their insulin resistance, their central obesity, visceral adiposity, that you might be able to actually reduce your levels of osteopontin 
Mm-hmm. And this could have then a downstream positive effect on our microglia. And- and, uh, correct. And this might be one of the mechanisms how um, it's through the microglia uh, that why high blood sugars accelerate cognitive decline uh, in worsened Alzheimer's, mm-hmm. uh, in worsened dementias. It's probably through the microglia. Uh, that's part of the mechanism would be would be my conjecture. And we'd have to have some experiments to investigate that, but it certainly seems plausible. Yeah. So another autoimmune disease that I think is of great interest to the people listening to this podcast is type 1 diabetes, because mostly we focus on type 2 diabetes in the spectrum of really acquired insulin resistant resistance um, and hyperglycemia that comes from that. But of course, this, there's this whole other branch of type 1 diabetes that is autoimmune destruction of our pancreatic beta cells, which reduce our insulin. So it's less an issue of insulin resistance and more an issue of not having enough insulin around. Um, and so I'm curious if, if this disease state um, also fits within the WALS protocol framework. And is there anything from uh, the framework and what we know about mitochondrial dysfunction and microbiome effects on autoimmune propensity that that can be applied to type 1 diabetes? Well, uh, yes. I, when we look at the uh, dramatic uptick of autoimmunity since World War II, uh, they talk about inflammatory bowel disease, MS, and type 1 diabetes, uh, that uh, there are environmental factors that are tied in uh, probably to the change in the food supply, the dramatic increase of fructose, uh, the dramatic increase of sugar processed foods, uh, the increase of um, uh, synthetic chemicals uh, in our diet, and the dramatic shift in our microbiome because of uh, all of the antibiotics. All of those are a factor in why those three um, autoimmune diseases have increased. Uh, so yes, it's not just the uh, infection that triggered the destruction of the uh, uh, pancreatic uh, islet cells. It is the environment that set that envir- that cascade up. I- I'll also uh, tell you that we've had uh, certainly many, many patients with type 2 diabetes uh, tell us that they've reversed their diabetes uh, using the WALS protocol. But I've also had many people with type 1 diabetes tell me that they've had dramatic improvement of their blood sugars uh, and their management uh, of their disease using the WALS protocol. Uh, there, there was one uh, lady um, who has a, a, a fairly remarkable story. Uh, she had uh, pulmonary sarcoidosis um, uh, in addition to type 1 diabetes uh, and was uh, in ICU uh, uh, because of her severe sarcoidosis on very high dose um, prednisone to control her sarcoid. And while she's in ICU, one of her neighbors hears my very first lecture that I gave here in Iowa City. Uh, and so the neighbor went to see Julie and her, and her husband to say, when you get out of the hospital, we're going to cook for you because I know how life is just so difficult. And the food they cooked was based on the principles that I laid out in that very first lecture, which looks very much like the principles I teach in my TED Talk. And her sarcoidosis melted away, stunning her physicians. So she was able to get off uh, her uh, prednisone. Her insulin control became, you know, much, much better. Her uh, renal disease had been uh, very severe. She was on the brink of needing dialysis, and her renal uh, function Im- improved remarkably, was no longer an immediate threat uh, for needing uh, dialysis. And then I finally met her about five years after the fact uh, at another conference, uh, and she told me that story. So uh, part of why I'm sharing that whole story for you, uh, Dr. Means, is that, and of course, I had no idea of, of the impact uh, that I had uh, for Julie, that you don't know the ripple effect of these podcasts, or no, do I know the ripple effect uh, of that TED Talk uh, or, my, or my books or the practitioners uh, that I teach. But the work we are doing 
is transforming the lives of millions and millions of people. So I, I, I so appreciate that you're taking the time uh, to do these podcasts. I appreciate that you are, uh, ha- had the brilliant insight to create levels, to give people the tools to get their insulin resistance under better control. It will have this ripple effect of millions and millions of lives. Well, thank you. And I I think that is so, so powerful. I mean, like I mentioned in the beginning, the ripple effect of your work, even in my own life, has been profound. And I, I didn't have an autoimmune disease. I actually just had a growing sense of questioning of the system I was in in medical school and picked up the WALS protocol as a first-year medical student and had my eyes opened um, to a different way of thinking about things. And of course, now 10 years later, here we are. And it's just, it is incredible the power of putting your ideas out there. And I'm just so grateful to you. And I, I, um, and, and many of the authors in this space who have really um, put themselves out there by challenging the convention and digging deeper and asking the question why over and over and over again. Um, And when I first started having uh, these public conversations, let me tell you, mm-hmm. the neurology community was very upset and <laughs> severely condemned over and over again. Um, I, but you know, I, I, fortunately, I stuck with it. I kept doing my little research, getting our, our papers published, uh, writing our grants. Um, and uh, I now have a joint appointment in mm-hmm. neurology. Uh, and uh, my neurology colleagues are um, co-investigators on my grants. Uh, and uh, I just got comments uh, today from the chief of neurology on my current proposal. And he's like, oh my gosh, Terry, this is very compelling, very exciting. Uh, and so uh, I've come a long way mm. in these um, 11 years from being you know, condemned as uh, you know, intolerably dangerous, to being seen as having these really interesting, innovative ideas that now my con- very conventional chief of neurology, uh, who is the chief of the uh, MS clinic, thinks are brilliant and visionary. Mm. So, mm. it takes a lot of good. bravery to be one of those first those first voices, and um, and I think there's a lot of people who would say, um, like, oh, you know, talking about dietary and lifestyle, even today, like dietary and lifestyle factors for treating disease is somehow subverting the standard of care. And that's, you know, dangerous. And, but the proof is in the pudding, you know, people who, first of all, these are, these are incredibly low risk strategies and people when, when you're in this functional medicine world, I think you and I can both attest to this and you see patients just getting better so rapidly, um, when they, when they implement these these principles well, of diet and lifestyle based in improving cell biology, it's incredibly motivating to keep doing this work. You know, when I first um, started changing how I practice medicine, uh, people were complaining. My chief of medicine, uh, uh, chief of staff at the VA called me in uh, uh, and I had to explain myself. Uh, and then uh, I had to go have the same conversation with the chief of medicine at the university who said, Terry, you're going to lose your license uh, because all we need is somebody to file a anonymous complaint. You'll get inspected uh, and uh, you'll be inspected by people who don't believe in functional medicine, integrative medicine. So you need to learn how to talk about this. Mm-hmm. So they sent me to uh, work with the <laughs> chief of the complementary alternative medicine clinic. Uh, and, and actually, it, it, I was very grateful that they did. So it became very clear with my patients and with the public that I'm, help, I'm, I'm focused on creating health. We're going to really focus on modifiable lifestyle factors. Uh, and we'll see how much, what your body can do with that. Mm-hmm. I'll have to watch you closely for your blood pressure, your blood sugar, and your current medication use so you don't become over-medicated. Uh, but we're going to focus on creating health using these basic lifestyle principles. And when I shifted how I spoke to my patients that way, and the residents, I quit getting complaints. And when I focused uh, my clinical notes that way, I quit getting complaints. And my chief of staff and my chief of medicine said, "Out a girl, we appreciate that you're doing that. You're gonna, uh, that'll be fine. You'll be, able, you'll be able to pass peer review because we need you to pass peer review, Terry. Uh, and so, you know, that's my, 
caution uh, when I train practitioners is that we, we have to teach you how to talk about this because you and I get so excited. It's so clear. Like, oh my God, this is treating and reversing so many disease states. But we have to be very careful that what we're doing is we're, create, we're focused on creating health and monitoring current medication use and adjusting them so people aren't over-medicated. Because mm. that language will feel very comfortable to our conventional colleagues and very respectful. As soon as I say, I'm treating MS with diet and lifestyle, that's not FDA approved, and that can be sanctioned, and that will not pass peer review. Mm -hmm. But if I say, I'm focused on creating health by treating diet and lifestyle, and we're going to watch your medications and adjust them so your blood pressure doesn't become too low, your blood sugar doesn't become too low, and then you can talk with your neurologist about what makes clinical sense to you. Yes. Everyone is very happy with that. You know, my neurologist colleagues are happy with that. My chief of medicine is happy with that. My chief of neurology is happy with that. Uh, and so we have to be careful that we teach our, our functional medicine uh, practitioners how to talk about this mm -hmm. in a way that respects conventional medicine respects the patients, respects the healing process. Because mm. what we're doing is we're creating health. And as a side effect, sometimes, not always, but sometimes, you regress a considerable amount of pathology mm. as a side effect of creating health. Mm. This is really a great discussion because I think it gets to um, what most people in medicine really want, which is positive impact and language has a lot to do with whether you can create the opportunity for impact because it matters, you know, and so how these things are talked about and, you know, position really does matter um, in terms of being able to have people hear it in a way that lands, um, lands in a way that's going to have the most, you know, the most impact. And so I think it's really such, such brilliant and hard earned, uh, such hard earned, um, insights that are that are great for people listening because i know a lot of people listening to this podcast also are trying to create um health promotion in their own communities and i think what you're talking about applies to really anyone who's on that path um before we conclude there's one question that i just is lingering in my mind that i really want to take an opportunity to ask you which is which is something that i think other people might also wonder which is you know we've got all these different autoimmune diseases that look very, very different from type 1 diabetes to rheumatoid arthritis to lupus to MS, they all have very different clinical faces. And what you talk about in the book is that there's, there's really mm -hmm. it's just a handful of core physiologic features that have kind of gone awry that can lead to all of these things. How does that happen in the body where in one person it might look like lupus and one person it might look like rheumatoid arthritis yeah. and another person it's MS? How do they show up yeah, in these it, different it, faces? Isn't that really interesting? So, we, you know, uh, we have disordered immune function. We have weakened mitochondria. We have toxin overload. We have hormone imbalance. Uh, we have difficulty eliminating our toxins. Uh, and I have uh, different sets of microbes uh, in my gut. And then I have different genetic vulnerability. I, and so depending on the microbes uh, and my genes, when my immune system get, gets revved up and I begin making autoantibodies, that will begin clearing out that infectious problem or that food protein that I think is an infection. If that protein has a similar amino acid sequence to another structure in my body, in my brain, in my joints, in my lungs, in my skin, that part of my body is going to get damaged as I clear out that, that problem protein, whether it's an infection uh, or uh, a food protein. Uh, and my vulnerability uh, is, so is a reflection of my genetics and my microbiome, and the foods, and the similar amino acid sequence between my structures and those various proteins. Uh, and then I'll, I'll add uh, to that. Um, so, I, I, and we could use my, myself as a, um, a case in point. 
Um, so as a youngster, I, I have migraines. Uh, that's an early uh, prodrome. I have really heavy periods. Uh, and um, I think that's just sort of a lot of women have miserable, heavy, heavy, heavy periods. Uh, and then when I decided I want to have kids, I discovered I have severe, severe endometriosis uh, and uh, end up uh, going through IVF. Uh, and uh, by then, I've all already had uh, uh, 10 years of my trigeminal neurology, which was a uh, the autoimmune process uh, involving my brain. So I had an autoimmune process uh, involving my brain. I have asthma, autoimmune process involving my lungs. I have an autoimmune process uh, involving uh, uh, the uh, endometriosis, uh, and I have very mild psoriasis. Mm. If if um, you don't address the root causes, you keep developing more autoantibodies, more autoimmune processes, and more parts of your body will become uh, uh, casualties in the autoimmune process development. Um, and, and so it's one of my messages to people is, yeah, you, you, uh, you may need disease-modifying drug treatment for your autoimmune disease that you have, but if you don't address the underlying root causes, you will continue to develop other autoimmune processes through this um, molecular mimicry, and you will pick up another body part casualty, whether it's asthma or psoriasis or endometriosis or autoimmune thyroid disease or Bichette's. So, and besides, you, you want to have healthy aging and healthy brain and all that stuff. So everyone, whatever you got, hmm. whatever chronic complex health problems you have, you want to be sure that you're also doing everything you can step by step with your modifiable lifestyle factors. Yeah. And you touched on something there that I think is also important in this metabolic health blood sugar conversation, which is the concept of warped proteins and that these can be a trigger for the body to fight. And I think it, I'd love for you to just touch on the relationship between glucose and warped proteins and glycation and how hyperglycemia might lead to some of this dysfunction in yes, yes. the structures of our body that then lead to the sense of the body being like, what is this? You know, what was going on there? And, and does the average person need to be thinking about this, even if they don't have diabetes, like well, to kind of control their blood sugar to prevent this? You know, I, I think um, we would be so far ahead in our healthy aging if we would all check our glucose uh, and uh, uh, check uh, for the possibility of insulin resistance, mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, ideally I'd like to see every, because you can be skinny and have insulin resistance. You can be skinny. You can not have any central obesity, uh, be thin on the outside and uh, fat on the inside. Uh, and so, if you have elevated blood sugars, you're going to be uh, at risk for this uh, glycation, uh, the sugar as uh, being attached uh, to the proteins and the proteins uh, becoming um, uh, oxidized, uh, mm -hmm. non-functional. And that will, uh, again, be an accelerant for this autoimmune process. And it can be an accelerant for that cell danger response. Mm -hmm. uh, and so. Um, and, you know, earlier we talked about how I, I wish we had taken uh, the uh, waist circumference uh, and the hip circumference so we could have more easily me measured metabolic syndrome. But if you aren't looking for insulin resistance, you're going to miss the thin on the outside, fat on the inside, uh, uh, because we have so deranged our diets. We have such terrible diets um, for so long that I, I would venture, I, I don't know what the number is, uh, how many people, what the percent, accurate percent would be that actually have insulin resistance. Um, but it is probably far higher than uh, the rate of obesity. Mm. I, I, I don't know, because um, I don't know that anyone has, has done any kind of population basis uh, to really look for that number. 
I mean, it'd be, I would just love to see a big retrospective study looking at a large hospital system triglyceride to HDL ratio, which is something we already have cholesterol panels on everyone. And that would give us a, at least a, a hint at insulin sensitivity. Yeah. Um, which could be really interesting. So anyone listening, uh, that might be uh, a good. That, that's a good idea. I could mention this that hmm. uh, to my postdoc. So let me. It actually could be a great medical student chart review because literally every adult patient has that cholesterol panel, and it'd be fascinating to see like who who's over one of a ratio, who's over two, who's over three. Uh, does it correlate with BMI? Uh, does it correlate with blood pressure? It's actually. This would be fun could, to work on. <laughs> that could be a, a nice uh, epi uh, study for a large data set such as women's yeah. uh, health health initiatives. So it'd be because I'd, I'd love to know that number. Like we unfortunately we don't have a threshold of like what is optimal or not. Some people say less than one. Some people say less than two point five in Caucasians and three point five in you know uh, people of African American descent. So it's it'd be interesting to look into just different thresholds. Um, but I bet the number is very very high of of sort of a, a high ratio. Really very high. Yeah, um, it'll be high. So, what, they, oh, go ahead, please. Well, th- then they could uh, look at uh, mortality risks uh, according to those ratios. So uh, that could be a nice, a very nice little epi study. So, yeah. Um, well, to wrap up, I what I I I I want people to go read the book and and watch the podcast so that they know the full walls protocol. But just a sort of actionable takeaway couple high yield things people can do to support their mitochondrial health uh, through diet and lifestyle. Um, what would well, what would be some of your top recommendations? So number one, uh, ditch all the sugar sweetened beverages. Number two, ditch, ditch all the fructose. Uh, all of those um, uh, paleo friendly uh, sugar substitutes that are all fructose, uh, get rid of those. Uh, number three, replace grain based products with vegetables. Uh, number four, uh, I'm a tall lady, six foot tall, so it's pretty easy for me to have nine cups of vegetables a day, three cups of green, three cups of sulfur, three cups of color, but I don't know how tall you are. Six feet. Uh, okay. So, I, uh, I can tell you in a, a nine cups, no problem. Uh, uh, and then uh, uh, if you're a meat eater, you know, six or 12 ounces uh, of meat. If you're not a meat eater, gluten-free grains uh, and legumes for your protein. Mm, perfect. Um, well, I hope that this conversation is is very um, uplifting for anyone listening who does have, is on the spectrum of autoimmune disease, um, is dealing with these things. I think the key message that we're talking about is that, and that you've promoted in such a beautiful way over the last over decade is that there is so much hope. There is a lot that we can do, but we do have to change the choices that we're making. Um, every day, but these choices can be wonderful, like including more beautiful vegetables, and they they work. Um, would you say that it's safe to say that focusing on improving metabolic health um, can be part of a journey in moving towards uh, improvement of of autoimmune disease? Like that oh, is yeah. an area. Yeah. Let me be even stronger. I I think uh, everybody with an autoimmune disease. Uh, really should go investigate their metabolic health. Um, I, I told everyone we should, you should know your glucose, your insulin uh, levels, your A1C, and uh, uh, answer that question: Do you have developing insulin resistance? Uh, and if you do, then we need to help uh, have a strategy for dealing with that. Uh, so yes, if you have an autoimmune disease, um, I very strongly urge you to investigate: Do you have insulin resistance? Amazing. How can people find you, Dr. Walls, online? Terry Walls, T-E-R-R-Y, Walls, W-A-H-L-S dot com. My Instagram handle is Dr. Terry Walls, and Facebook and Twitter is Terry Walls. And I highly recommend following your Instagram because you often do a meal recap of what you're having for supper. And very frequently, it inspires me to have a slightly healthier dinner because I, I know what you're eating. So very much recommend that. But thank you so much for taking your time today to educate this audience and really appreciate you, you being here, Dr. Walls. Thank you. Thank you.